Permit me first to thank all party parliamentary group on international conservation and its chair, honorable member of parliament, you, Mr. Barry Gardner, for the invitation and for the opportunity to address uh, this audience. Let me begin by reminding ourselves that the adoption of the convention stemmed from the growing international recognition that biological diversity is a global asset of tremendous value to the present and future generations, and that human activities were and are still gravely endangering it. Biodiversity is the foundation of human life. We cannot live without the biodiversity that feeds us, houses us, cures us, and provides us with the water we drink and the air we breathe. However, recent assessments have painted a stark picture. Last year, IPBS Global Assessment Report warned us that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. Earlier this year, the World Economic Forum's annual Global Risks Report identified climate change and nature loss as two of its most critical environmental risks. Their destruction of nature eroding the world's economic service ecosystem services and a pin for the $4 trillion of economic value, virtually over half of the world's total GDP. More recently, our own fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook provided the final assessment of the progress we have made on the AICH biodiversity targets. Unfortunately, none of the targets have uh, been completely met. And out of the 20 targets, only six will be partially achieved by the end of this year. The report comes as the COVID-19 crisis challenges us to rethink on our relationship with nature, to consider the profound consequences of our own well-being and the survival that can result from the continuing loss of biodiversity and degradation of ecosystems. As the global community faces one of the greatest health, economic, social, and environmental and developmental challenges of our time, we must ask ourselves, how can we prevent this from happening again? Certainly, these challenges are multifaceted and they thus cannot be tackled in isolation. We are at a pivotal period in history, a period which requires visionary leadership and action to redirect our development pathways, drawing on the best science. Our conference of the parties uh, 15, that will take place in Kuming, China next year, as well as the preparatory road ahead of it, represents a landmark moment for the global community. We are working closely with our host government to ensure a historic and successful meeting, one that will hopefully witness the adoption of a robust, ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework and announcements of ambitious commitments from governments and other stakeholders. The post-2020 global biodiversity framework will play a pivotal role in building resilience in the face of growing socioeconomic challenges. It will galvanize the global community to seek collaborative multi-stakeholder joint solutions across sector, several sectors. It is our hope that this framework will serve as an umbrella strategy also for many other multilateral environmental agreements, organizations, and non-state actors providing coherent guidance and support to the international community to conserve and sustainably use global, I mean, biological diversity and ecosystems. Similarly, it will assist and contribute in parallel to the implementation of other global goals, such as the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The summit 
on UN summit on biodiversity that took place last month, September, was an important milestone on the road to COP15. It highlighted the strong interlinkages between climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation. It further reminded the international community that nature-based solutions, building on the preservation and restoration of biological diversity and ecosystems, offer an important opportunity for shared progress towards the decade of action for sustainable development. The outcomes of COP15 will send strong and timely signal to the important discussions that will lead us all to Glasgow Climate Change Conference. These meetings have the responsibility to determine the international frameworks and guidance to help countries achieve this transition to eliminate poverty while protecting our fragile natural systems. Therefore, we need to ensure coherent and collective push to address the twin threats of climate change and biodiversity loss. And in this regard, I commend the efforts of the governments of the United Kingdom and our host China in striving to highlight the interlinkages between biodiversity loss and climate change and exploring ways to ensure synergies in the successful outcomes of both our COP15 and climate COP26. The need for effective materialism has never been greater or more urgent than today. We will need transformative changes of our development models, as well as a whole of government, whole of society integrated approaches on the basis of shared responsibility and global solidarity in order to restore and protect nature, thereby ensuring the integrity and advancement of human well being. Greener and sustainable post COVID 19 recovery approaches provide an opportune moment for such transformation. In order to achieve the level of transformation required, we need to work hand in hand with all sectors to reinforce the political importance of biodiversity at the highest levels. This is the reason parliamentarians have a very important role to play in the lead up to the adoption of this ambitious framework. Let us work together, take the actions needed for the sustainable future and to achieve our 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Thank you very much for listening.